here. My name is Carmen. I am a myofunctional therapist as well as a myofunctional educator. So I'm happy you're here and I'm glad that you're watching this. One of my biggest goals for 2019 was really to engage and educate my community. So that means that I'm digging deep and I'm diving, you know, making sure that I explore and answer questions that you guys all have. So this week, my, uh, my blog topic was, do I have a tongue tie? So that is a huge question that I get over and over repeatedly every week. So while it's a great topic, in this episode, in this Facebook Live, I'm going to be talking about what functional assessment tools that I use to diagnose that tongue tie. For some people, this is really obvious with appearance. So some people come to me and they have um, a very obvious tie. They can't lift the tongue out of the floor of the mouth. Or some people just talking, you can see it's such a struggle that they have an obvious tie. So we're not so much really talking about those people as we're talking about the people who maybe ask their doctor, maybe ask their dentist, who have a, a concern with a tongue tie, but they, um, they're told that they're fine. So a great example of this would be somebody um, like an ENT that I've worked with who, or that we had a mutual client who tells the little boy, yeah, you have a tongue tie, uh, but you don't have a speech impediment, so you're fine. Another dentist that I worked with said, yeah, you have a tongue tie, but unless it bothers you eating an ice cream cone, you're fine. So really, if you think about it, Today, in today's day and age, we don't identify things or diagnose things based on just one closed-minded view of it or one test. We don't do, you know, look at one symptom and say, oh yeah, you have A, B, and C. So to me, that's really closed-minded, and I spend a lot of time uh, educating people on the, the functional assessment that I do in helping somebody understand whether they have a tongue tie or not. So that's what we're going to talk about in this session. So first, let's talk about I do a general, a, a few general tests, and then some functional tests. And so the general tests, while they're wonderful and they give me a lot of information, it's more about the functional impairment that I'm looking for when I'm looking to diagnose somebody whether they have a tongue tie. So, but let's first talk about those general tests. So first we look at the change in range of motion. And so the, the range of motion that change that, that we look at is evaluating somebody. We use these, um, see if you can see it here, these range of motion scales that allow us to take two measurements. So I take a measurement with somebody as wide open as they can be, and then I take a measurement with somebody as, as wide open as they can be with their tongue elevated to the spot that is really the incisive papilla behind their front teeth. So if you were to look at me, I don't really lose a lot of range of motion. Some people, they can open really, really wide, and then when they put their tongue up to the spot, they close down. Uh, I have some clients who have such significant ties that they can't even comfortably get the tongue up to the spot. So we're definitely talking ranges. Um, so range of motion, so the loss of range of motion is an important piece of the puzzle. It's not the only one. So it's this, that information, that percentage that we use to grade a tongue tie. So there's four grades. Grade four is the worst, and that's somebody who really has their tongue tied down. And that's one of those real obvious ones. But what about those people that have maybe a one or a two, but they're compensating so well. So their body has done really good to work through some of these things, but they still have issues. So that, like I said, is a great piece of information. That's what we call a general test. The next piece of information is the, alter, uh, the alteration of the shape of the tongue when it's elevated. So those people with obvious classic tongue ties, they raise their tongue and it makes that nice little heart shape. They're not all that easy to identify. I have many, many clients who raise their tongue and it doesn't look like that classic heart shape, so I have to dig a little bit deeper. Of course, having this information is part of their clinical file, but it's not the end-all be-all. 
Next, and then last for uh, the general test, is I look to see where that, that freedom under the tongue attaches, both on the tongue and then in the floor of the mouth. So if the end that attaches in the floor of the mouth, if it kind of spreads out and looks like it has legs, that's where we get the Eiffel Tower tie. Now I have had clients where that just barely spreads and I have had clients where that spreads uh, canine to canine, so they have this big web in there. Um, the other thing is, is if, if it's attaching into the floor of the mouth, but when the person elevates their tongue, <sighs> it looks like they're totally sucking the floor of that mouth up, that's not something that we want to see. So that's an excellent um, compensation. That doesn't mean that it's normal. Another thing that I look at is where that freedom attaches underneath the tongue. So, you know, traditionally we're looking for that freedom to be in a certain area, not at the end of the tongue, which as you can visualize would be anchoring the tongue down if it's up here. But if I have somebody who has a short frenum and it's anchoring in the middle of the tongue, some people may say that's totally normal. And I say absolutely not because I can see that it's short, it's little, it might be thick. Anytime somebody does something with their tongue and it's a struggle, that isn't necessarily normal. So while I look at that, that fixation of the frenum on both ends, that is not the ultimate thing that I look at. So that ultimate thing that I look at is the, the functional test that I put my clients through. Now, some, like I said, are very, very obvious, in which case some of these functional tests are very difficult for them to be able to, to do normally or even do at all. Other people may think they're totally normal until we do these functional tests. So the first one would be protrusion and retraction. So that's sticking the tongue out and then bringing the tongue in. Unfortunately, this is probably the most common test that providers, especially dental providers, will do. Oh, you think you have a tongue tie? Stick your tongue out. Mm. Okay, no, you're good. Well, they never study whether that tongue is out and whether they can control it and you know I want it to be like a diving board I want it to be well supported and strong and when somebody sticks their tongue out if it pulls down is that just because it's weak or is that because there's that little you know I always say it's like a little troll living under the tongue with a rope that's pulling the tongue down that makes it impossible to function properly um, so when a dentist asks you oh stick your tongue out oh you're good that misses the most important part which is actually the elevation of the back of the tongue. And so when I have somebody who has swallowing issues, they have snoring and sleep apnea concerns, I can really, with pretty high confidence, as to, you know, figure out that their tongue is down. It may be tied down and, and their tongue, the back of their tongue is not up. So in a swallow, the back of the tongue is the most important part in working with snoring and sleep apnea clients, having the back of the tongue elevated into the roof of the mouth like it's supposed to be for proper tongue posture, that supports the airway also. So that is very important. And in, in swallowing correctly, I have clients that say, my tongue doesn't even move. They probably choke a lot, you know, it's hard to say. So when we look at protrusion and retraction, I'm looking not only to see if somebody can put their tongue out, but I wanna see how they can control it. Is it strong, is it weak, is, it, uh, is there no coordination? Um, can they hold it straight or does it fall? Uh, and the same with bringing the tongue back in on that retrusion. So that is that explanation of that part. Next, I move my client on to, if they stick their tongue out, what happens when they try and touch it to their upper lip? So a lot of people who have myofunctional impairment will roll their upper lip under. I don't wanna see that, that's compensation. I'm looking to see somebody be able to do it without compensating. Uh, when somebody can't do that, then we have some functional impairment, okay? Another piece of the puzzle. Next, what happens when I have my clients lateralize the tongue? So that's taking it sideways. 
when I'm working with my clients, I really want them to act like their mouth, their open mouth space is like a, a, a circle and or a pie and they're trying to cut that in half. I'm looking to see that tongue slowly go back and forth, be controlled. I don't want to see it drop on one side or the other. And many clients and even some of my clients who have had um, reattachment or have had an incomplete release, they can say, you know what, Carmen, I can move my tongue one direction, but when I do it the other direction, it is a struggle. I can feel it pulling. I can feel it pulling in my in my clavicle, in my neck, all of these other places telling me, okay, something is wrong. So when I have somebody do this functional assessment for me, I have them open and try and touch the corners of their mouth with their tongue and have it be controlled. So it's going to look like this. Notice that my tongue is kind of skinny, and that's because I can control my tongue. Some people flop their tongue out, and the lights are on, but nobody's home. The tongue is just laying there. It's flaccid. It has no muscle control, and it's, it's never functioned properly. So those people trying to do a tongue point when they have a pancake tongue, going to be pretty impossible. Some people also have such a significant tie that this motion is very difficult because they've got that rope under there and so moving their tongue makes it hard. So when I am doing my functional assessment of these people, I'm watching for that tongue to drop on the corners because that tells me that they got over here and bam, that was too hard for them to, um, to keep that lateralization going. This, being able to lateralize your tongue and to move it, uh, is really important not only for functional to be able to function properly but to manipulate food the tongue is a tool and so not only is it meant to be a tool to clean your teeth and help um, prevent decay you know dental concerns that way the tongue is supposed to help you move the food around you're supposed to chew it bilaterally which means on both sides and then your tongue helps get it into a nice pile in the middle of the tongue which is called the bolus so you can swallow pr uh, properly and you also need the back of the tongue for that nice way so if I have somebody whose tongue lays their flaccid like a pancake and they can't do anything with it then we have myofunctional impairment um, next the next uh, test that I put them through is, can they use their tongue to reach their molars? I also don't want to see their jaw shifting. So a lot of people will struggle. Sure, I can do it, Carmen, absolutely. And their jaw goes over. That's not what we want. I want to see that somebody can do this and not move their jaw. Many people have never felt the real estate on their back molars, and those people sometimes have a super duper long tongue, uh, and, and then they've been told it's fine, but they can't function properly. Um, people really who have um, a long tongue probably can reach their molars, but you never know. That is just one of the functional assessments. And then last is, can they suction their tongue up? So for me, that demonstration looks like this. And I could hold my tongue up there all day. Many, many, many of my clients can't even, uh, they can't get their tongue up there. And that's a big concern. And many, unfortunately, many of these people have been told, you're fine, you're normal. I wouldn't do anything about that. So I hope that that helps you. A lot of people come to me about a tongue tie, and a lot of people just focus on that. And you'll hear me say this again and again. I probably said it in my new blog post that went up today, that it's not just about the tongue tie. The tongue tie is a piece of the puzzle. It's a physical barrier that has to be, uh, you know, you have to take that barrier out of the way for somebody to get better. That's really the only difference. If I have somebody who doesn't have a tongue tie and their tongue is just laying, well, we need to get those muscles functioning properly. And that 
starts with myofunctional therapy. So a great example would be, you know, somebody who's in a wheelchair, they still have legs. That doesn't mean that they're working right. So that is really what differentiates tongue tie and then just what I call basic myofunctional impairment. So if you're curious, run through some of these tests. Go in the bathroom, look in the mirror, and put yourself through some of these functional tests. If you try and lift your tongue with everything that you have, if you're, you know, I always tell people, watch this area here. If you are using your platysma or everything you have to lift from your clavicle, then you have something going on. That's not normal. People shouldn't have to struggle to use all of these other muscles to lift. That's compensation. If you go in and you can't suction your tongue up or you can't reach your tongue to uh, your upper lip without curling your upper lip down to meet it, if any of these tests seem weird to you, then you potentially have a concern. See how things look, see how things feel. Because a little bit ago, I talked about how you grade a tongue tie. And for some therapists, they really live and die on that, that range of motion percentage. And some doctors do also. I'll have clients that go to the doctor and they say, well, you have a tongue tie, but it's not bad enough to do anything about. Okay, well, false. Uh, I encourage those people to arm themselves with education, and that means if they've had a myofunctional exam, they understand all of those other things that matter. I've had clients that barely have a grade two tie, so we would call that, some people would call that a mild tie, but had tons and tons of myofunctional impairment that supported having that phrenectomy taken care of to help that restriction. So just because somebody tells you that you're fine, if you put yourself through these functional assessments, you feel like you are stressed, intense, or something hurts. I mean, people will say, Carmen, it hurts. It hurts on the left side, it hurts on the right side. Anything that's not normal needs to be recognized as not being normal. It doesn't matter if the person who tells you that you're normal is a dentist or some other practitioner because maybe they don't know what they're looking for. And that's part of the problem with diagnosing a tongue tie is it's not really black and white. People don't know, there's a lot of confusion. Some people think one thing, some think another. And that really is where my job comes in because not only do I have to educate my community, I have to also educate the practitioners that I work with to make sure they understand not only how I'm diagnosing, uh, but the importance of myofunctional therapy and that they have the same practice protocol that I do. Uh, also, if you have done these functional assessments and you are still curious, uh, last week I talked about the assessment tool that you can get over on my blog, and that helps you go through the questions that, that, that help you connect the dots. So that helps you, because a lot of people want to figure this out for themselves. They want to see if they have a concern, do they have a tongue tie. I'm not quite sure what they're going to do with that information, but a lot of people just want to know if they have a concern. So between the two things, between the, the free download that you can get over on the blog, which, by the way, is uh, myofunctional therapy for you, and that's the number for the letter U.com. So myofunctionaltherapyforyou.com forward slash blog. You can get that there. You can go through those questions. You can do the, these functional tests. That's really going to help you in determining if you need to talk to somebody. It doesn't have to be me. It can be anybody who knows and understands this field. I recommend that to be a myofunctional therapist, not your dentist because, or not your ENT because a lot of times they don't understand that and they may be one of those closed-minded people who say, well, yeah, but you're fine. So if you arm yourself with information, you understand what it is that's concerning and why because a lot of people in adults, they, they can't figure out why a tongue tie matters for an adult because the craniofacial growth has already happened. And so I tell adults, if you have a tongue tie and you don't do anything about it, then you potentially can have a lifelong complications 
leading to, you know, symptoms leading to um, sleep disorder breathing, obstructive sleep apnea. You can have, you know, chronic headaches, chronic head and neck tension, all of those things that really don't sound any fun to, to deal with for the rest of your life. So uh, use these tools, use my information to help educate yourself, and then if you have questions, I am certainly always here. You can always find me um, or post something, post a question in the Facebook group, and I will respond to that. Um, okay, so let's talk about next week. Uh, my blog topic next week is going to be, can a phrenectomy help relieve symptoms? So a lot of people come to me and they want to know if a phrenectomy is going to help that pain go away in their left big toe. We may talk about that. Uh, is this going to happen? Is that going to happen? There is no guaranteed recipe, but we're certainly going to dive into a lot of that information and maybe um, some myths, that kind of stuff. Uh, and then on Facebook next week, I will be going further into what are the most common symptoms that a phrenectomy helps. So we never want to sound like snake oil salesmen or used car salesmen. So I'm very careful in the way that I educate to, to let people know, well, this is very common to see an improvement and that maybe not so much, but hey, if it happens, we'll take it. So with that said, thank you so much for being here. I love the opportunity to educate you. If you have any questions, please post them in the comments below and I'll make sure that they get answered. I will see you next week. Thank you.